All right, as uh, Brother Nate, <clears throat> Nathan has mentioned, is this loud or is it just me? Good, okay. Uh, as he's mentioned, this has become one of my favorite topics in the Bible. Obviously, Jesus is the best topic in the Bible. Um, I guess it was uh, about 20 years ago, Brother Bobby Sparks came to the old building, and that's the first time I really heard much about the Old Testament tabernacle. So I fell in love with it, but I didn't actually get started until more recently. Uh, I've worked on this project now for quite a few years. I guess I finished my tabernacle about three years ago, and it took me about three years to kind of put this together. And But it's been a, a blessing, not only because I enjoy it, but I had to study it. And that's one thing about a, a topic that you like, you, uh, you have to dig into it. And that's the way it should be with the whole Bible. But as you see, I titled this The Perfect Tabernacle, Christ in the Wilderness. And the focus of this series is God's providence concerning man's desperate need for a Savior. Now, that's the focus. The subject is the journey from the wilderness of sin, capital S-I-N, and of course the spiritual sin, but the wilderness of sin to the service in the wilderness and on to the throne room of heaven. And we'll get to some of those details as we go along. Now, I'm sure everyone here knows, I don't have to tell you a lot of the details, but whenever the Israelites left Egypt, God gave Moses the instructions to build this tabernacle that we see a model of. And uh, the instructions were very, very precise. God did amazing things in leading them. Uh, they needed something to lead them away from the Egyptian gods. They had been living under that influence for a long time. In fact, if you think about it, man, we live under the influence of the world until we accept the Lord. And then we still, if we're not careful, we return back just like those Israelites did. But Jesus is God's greatest tabernacle. Tabernacle means a temporary structure. And He lived in His temporary vessel to provide a, a way of redemption by God's perfect design. If, if anybody thinks there's something wrong with God's plan, you don't know God. God's plan is perfect, and this design is what pointed people to that perfection. So the Old Testament tabernacle pictures the New Testament tabernacle. Uh, if you really dig in, this is Jesus. All of this is about Jesus. The tabernacle Moses built served as a picture of Christ in the wilderness of sin. And Jesus came to deliver man out of the wilderness of sin. So my goal today is to help everyone see the significance of this and how it does represent Christ. Now it reveals man's sin. It reveals man's need for salvation. It reveals man's need for service. And of course it reveals uh, Jesus Christ and His offering for sin. This is what we're going to focus on. Now, you may not remember all the details. You may say, I don't want to hear all those details. I'm not going to remember them anyway. Well, you're going to hear them. Whether you remember them or not, it's up to you. But I hope that the messages will come through that will help you. And uh, they helped me tremendously because I thought I knew a little bit about the Old Testament. When I came here, well, over there to the old school, I realized real quick I didn't know a whole lot. I still don't know a whole lot. And I will say this before I jump right into this. Soak it up. While you're in seminary, get everything out of it you can. Uh, most of the teachers will probably tell you the same thing. I wish I could come back because I still need a whole lot of instruction in the Word of God. All right, let's go ahead and see if we can get this thing. Uh-oh. Yeah. Now give me just a second. We're having some connection issues. Aha. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the, uh, the structure and all this, just the layout, the way things were built, and we're going to talk about the perfect pattern, which is the first part. And I have slides. Brother Bobby Sparks uh, had slides made. And I'll tell you a blessing that I have. Uh, he had some men to experiment and play around with some slides about the tabernacle. It cost him about $10,000. He said, I asked him about the voice. Y'all hear the voice in a minute. And I said, I'd like to have that voice over. He said, you bring me a USB drive and I'll give you all of it. So that's $10,000 worth of material that, that I didn't even have to purchase because God bless. Let's see if we can, that's still not acting right. Just hit that arrow button and see if it'll go. I don't know why it's not connecting. 
All right, here's our key verse for this particular part. Hebrews 8, 5, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern show thee in the mount." Now, before we get to our next slide, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the workers. There were two men specifically named that the Lord said to Moses, you're going to get these men and they're going to be the ones to lead. Exodus chapter 31, 3, 4, and 5 says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. This was about a man named Bezalel, and he also had a partner in this named Aholiab. These were the men that it says specifically that God gave them the Holy Spirit to build this right here. This is by God's design. This is what God wanted, not what man wanted. We know what man can do as far as uh, doing things wrong. All right, just go ahead and hit it. My pointer's not working. You probably have to hit it again for it to start. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side southward. There shall be hangings for the court of fine twine linen of a hundred cubits long for one side, and the twenty pillars thereof and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. The hooks of the pillars and the fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for the north side and length there shall be hangings of a hundred cubits long and his twenty pillars and their twenty sockets of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits. The hangings of one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hangings fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of twenty cubits, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen, wrought with needlework. And their pillars shall be four, and their sockets four. All the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be an hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twine linen, and their sockets of brass. All the vessels of the tabernacle, and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court, shall be of brass. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. Alright, the Hebrew word for court means an enclosed yard. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time uh, on the meaning of that, but when you look Watch the video, listen to the scriptures or whatever. You'll see that it gave the general idea, the general layout. You had 60 posts. You had uh, 75 cubits wide, 150 cubits long. Uh, excuse me, feet. Um, let me convert that over to feet. I'm going to use the uh, reference of 18 inches per cubit. I realize there are different uh, suggestions. So let me rephrase that. 75 feet by 150 feet. That was the general measurement if you use that particular standard. There were 60 posts all the way around. Uh, the fabric was the outer curtain. And of course, that's what divided everything else away. I'm not going to spend the time focusing on all the tribes. That's something else. It would take a lot of time to talk about the tribes that were stationed out around the, uh, the tabernacle, out in the wilderness. God gave uh, specific details. He told them where to camp. He told them to go a certain distance away to be a, a space in between. The Levites were to encamp uh, within that area. 
But we see that all of these pieces, he described what this was to be down to every single detail. He didn't leave out any measurements. He didn't leave out any instructions. He said, this is the way it's going to be, and you've got to make it this way. He described uh, the post. He described the brass sockets. I don't know exactly how those would have been built or how they were made, but they were made for a base or a foundation for those posts to stand up in whenever they erected it. Also, there were what were called capitors, which if you look on this one, it's little silver tops. That's probably where we get a word cap from, something that's just a covering for the top. Somebody say, well, why do they have silver on them? Because God told them to. I don't know. God said put the silver on there. That's what they did. All right, then you had hooks. And that's where these uh, long pieces went. They were like curtain rods, the fillets. And I don't know the exact method of how those work, but those hooks went from post to post to post. And I, just to give you a little fun fact, on mine I used the eye screws. Well, on all of this model, counting the eye screws for the actual structure, there are over 400 little eye screws that I had to put in there. But it's the same as what they had to do. Every single part of it, they had to put in specific things in order to hold it all together. All right. Then there was the hanging of the gate. It showed the picture there, uh, 30 feet long. And uh, we can all use our imagination on what it looked like. Blue, purple, and scarlet is what was mentioned. Uh, I don't know the design. It was lines on this. Mine has cubes. It's just a design I decided to use. So uh, you can use your imagination there. But we'll get to the fact that it was made uh, with fine twine linen courtyard uh, fence. We'll get to that later because I don't want to uh, bring that out just yet. But we are going to see blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen all through this entire set of lectures. So keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and go to that next uh, slide real quick. Boards from the tabernacle of Shittimwood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenants shall there be in one board, set in order one against another. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle. Twenty boards on the south side, southward. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards. Two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be twenty boards, and there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. And two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides, and they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it unto one ring, and they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle, for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the board shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. All right, in order to understand the significance and focus of the tabernacle, it's necessary to understand that structure. In fact, that part of it is probably one of the most significant things about this is the structure itself. The animation of the structure showed the elements of the construction. It also showed a couple of the pieces of furniture. Uh, and it's important to know that when you went through that gate, you had the brazen altar. If you studied much about it, you would know some of the details. Then you had the laver went through the first veil and you had the uh, what we call the holy place on the left side you had the uh, candlestick on the right side you had the uh, table of showbread right in front you had the altar of incense then you had the veil that everybody knows about the one that separated the holy place and the holy of holies and of course through there you had the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat so most everybody is familiar 
with at least some of this right here. You watch enough Indiana Jones, you'll at least learn something about the uh, Ark of the Covenant, right? But God gave, I, I'm going to say this again because it's very important. God gave very precise instructions for this structure, for this courtyard, for every single bit of it. And if you were watching, there were boards. And let me tell you about those boards. According to the 18-inch cubit, 27 inches wide, 18 inches thick, 15 feet tall, these boards right here. And imagine building all of those boards and the pillars, which are the post in between, out of wood. We have saws. We have all these fancy things that we can use to build things with. And sometimes we do a terrible job. These men had to do it by hand. They had to have amazing uh, abilities and even tools. I think we don't uh, understand. We underestimate them whenever we talk about that. There were bars, the long bars that held it together. Uh, if you looked and you saw that, you'd see where it talked about five bars, but the picture looked like it was only going to show four bars. There was a bar that went right straight through every one of those boards on all the sides. And I tried it. I didn't do it through both sides, but on this end piece, I drilled the hole all the way through, and I run my little board in there, and it took a lot of work. But that thing was so sturdy, it wouldn't even hardly bend. The others... They've been. I, I just gave up after I did the first one. But all of these things were for stability. You had the silver, you had the gold, the brass, all of these things that were made in order for this to work. But folks, everything about this had a purpose. Everything. Now, it doesn't mean that every single thing has a spiritual representation, but everything had its own purpose. The importance of understanding how precise God was about each detail is the clear fact that God's plan is always perfect. And I think as men, we think we've got it all figured out. We know how to do things. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. I'm here to tell you if it's not God's way, it's wrong. Amen. It has to be God's way or no way. So it's the same for God's plan of salvation. It's the same for God's plan of service. It has to be built the way He has designed it without any variation whatsoever. It's clear and precise. Let's go ahead and do the one with the coverings. First of all, you had the linen covering. Now, there are a lot of details about these coverings that we don't really cover, but these things were made into several pieces and connected together with what, what's called tatches. I don't know exactly what that means. I always think of it as a, a button. It's a hook style button. But we look at it as one piece, but there were actually many pieces to it. But I want to give you something to think about. Uh, it was made out of fine twine linen. And what that means is it came from what's called a flax plant. You saw some of the flax plant recently. Uh, this is a straw-shaped plant. grows really tall. They would take it, they would uh, cut it, lay it out, let it dry, and then they would break the husk off. In fact, I had some of the husk in my uh, kit, but I didn't bring it out here. They'd break the husk off, and this is what they would end up with, just an odd fiber. And then what they would do is they would comb through it and find the widest ones they could get. Can you imagine going through and getting all the little white fibers you can out of this that were really pretty in order to make all of this fabric seven and a half feet tall, 150 feet long. And then of course you have that top covering that goes over the structure all out of this. You know, just a thought, when it comes to uh, you and I, many times we won't even search through the Scriptures very well to find what we need. Right. But they had to separate. They had to look. They had to make sure that it was done to perfection as best they could. If you noticed on that covering, and I, I take mine with me whenever I, I go, but there were the cherubim. Those are the uh, angelic uh, beings. They did uh, images of those on that covering. That was the first covering. Blue, purple, and scarlet. You're going to hear that a lot. 
Uh, we don't know the exact design. If you notice the uh, slide that was on there, there were a whole bunch of them. Well, I tried to do something that was um, biblical. I put 12. I thought that was fitting. I put four over the Holy of Holies and eight over the holy place. Uh, I wouldn't argue about that if you had a better answer. But uh, representations. Now this is more uh, an idea, and I think it's a good idea. Blue represents the color of heaven. You know, we go outside, we look up, we see the blue skies, and a lot of people think of, of heaven. It's kind of a, a, a generalization or something that we can compare it to. We know white always represents righteousness. We know that uh, purple represents royalty. We know that red represents blood or redemption. You could just go on and on. But my thought is, and I think I've heard this, uh, I do say some things that Brother Bobby said, those cherubim could be seen while people were inside uh, the structure. And so you had the cherubim watching over you while you were doing your duties. Now I want you to think about that with us. Because this is, hey, preachers, workers, God's watching over us all the time. Everything we do, that's a scary thought if you think about it. Not scary, it ought to be a humbling thought that God is watching. Next, you had the goat's hair covering. This was actually hair woven together. Not skins, hair woven together. Some renderings and replicas show a covering that's more of a gray or an off-white. But it's uh, been studied out that there were black goats in that region. And it makes sense that black would be the color of that second covering. Because you had white... Then you had black. White represents righteousness. Black represents sin. And of course, we'll get into that as we go along. But we need to see all of the coverings and all the workings in order to see what this applies to. Next, you have the ram skins dyed red. I don't know where they got all the dye. I just know they had to have a bunch of it. Many times these dyes were taken from plants or mussels or different things that were in the sea. Whatever they were, it was a whole lot of it that had to be collected. One of the best stories that we know when it comes to a ram is Abraham and Isaac. We know what happened. And I want you to think about this. Abraham was told to take his son and offer him. And, and I've got this in my notes later as well. But can you imagine, if you're a father, uncle, well, you're a child, you know how it is to have parents. Could you imagine that? Being told to take your child, your son... Well, we know what's significant about that is God gave him a sacrifice, a replacement for Isaac. So he offered the ram in place of, the, uh, of his son. Next, you have the badger skin covering. And it's often misunderstood. This is not a little burrowing creature. This is something more like this. Uh, called a dugong. And there's debates about that. Some would say a sea cow or a manatee or something of that nature. But this particular animal was very plentiful in the Mediterranean Sea. And so this is what is suggested that the covering was. And I have a little brown covering. kind of looks leathery. It would have been something that if there was any weather it would have protected from it. Um, then you had the entrances. And that what I'm saying is, is the gate and then the two veils. Uh, they were also white, and they uh, represented the righteousness of Jesus. The fence entrance was the same materials, fine twine linen, blue, purple, scarlet, served as a door into the courtyard, and it was the only place to enter. You couldn't go in anywhere else. You know, my little model here has little gaps, you know, because I had to be able to separate it. But I believe when they attached it all together, it was attached. You know, you, you couldn't get through it. You couldn't go over it. Uh, there was no way. And I'll tell you this. If you ever did sneak underneath there, you'd die. Now, my fault, I don't think you would die inside the holy ground. I think you'd die when you got back out. That's just my thought. Y'all can uh, give me your thoughts on that later. Now, the uh, entrance is a picture of Jesus as the way. Jesus is the only way in. When it comes to redemption, when it comes to a relationship with the Lord, Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6, we know that verse. He is the way. Y'all know, you uh, scholarly fellows, you know that when it says the, the word the in the Greek, it means the one and only. 
There's no other way to get to Jesus except for the place that He made. And we know it's narrow. It's not broad. He made one way, and that's what this represents is Jesus, to be able to enter in. All right? Now, when you went into the second veil, or the second entrance, which was the first veil, let me say that correctly, only certain individuals were to pass that place. If you were just an average Israelite, you went in, you went to this place here, you did what you came to do, and then you left. You never did go any further than that first part of it. But certain individuals were allowed in this uh, middle place, which is the holy place. You had uh, the same colors, same material that was made for that veil. And then, of course, you had the third entrance into the Holy of Holies. And I've talked about that a little bit. But the first hanging is a good representation. And I'm talking about the entrance. A good representation of Jesus as the truth. So we've had the way, now we have the truth. Well, where do you get that from? Well, Jesus is light, Jesus is bread, uh, Jesus is the intercessor. Where do you get that from? Light, bread, prayer. Jesus is those things. So truth, we can see truth in that particular place. And then, of course, in the Holy of Holies, folks, that is a picture of the throne room of God. That's where we have life. John 14, 6. Did God intend that verse for that? I don't know, but it sure will preach because it's true. It's true. It's exactly what we need. Okay, uh, outside the courtyard, the congregation of people uh, represent the world. The people that camped out. It, people say two and a half million people, thereabouts, that left out of Egypt. Can you imagine traveling through the wilderness Two and a half million people, plus all of your animals, because they had a lot of animals. They had to have them. I've heard Brother Bobby say that uh, you better like your neighbor because you always had to travel in the same formation. It was like military. So wherever you set up camp, you had the same neighbor. You better hope you had a good neighbor wherever you were. But you, the people were camped out around the tabernacle in formation and, of course, represented the world. Now, the Holy of Holies represents the throne room of God. And if man doesn't enter the spiritual courtyard, they are separated from God. If you don't enter through, Jesus has the way, you're separated. Come on now, Romans 5, 12. Y'all know these scriptures, but we've got to be able to teach them and understand what they mean. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Alright, so every single individual who's ever lived has been a sinner except for one. All right. When Adam sinned in the garden, he went from enjoying fellowship in the spiritual courtyard of God to a place of separation and desperation. Can you imagine being able to just talk to God? Being able to just fellowship with God? Seeing His perfect creation? The next thing you know, you're naked, ashamed, separated because of sin. Genesis uh, teaches us all about that. Adam and Eve were uh, open, their eyes were open to the fact that they chose to sin and they knew they were naked. Now that doesn't just mean physically. Yes, they were naked physically, but spiritually before a holy and righteous God, they were naked. And of course, nakedness is a representation of shame. All right? This is what I like to call man's first attempt at works for salvation, and I call it the fig leaf salvation. Give you something to think about there. Have you ever picked figs before? You know how irritating fig leaves are? That's the way it works for salvation would be. Because why? Well, first of all, those things are itchy. Now, it may not have been the same. It may have been different. But they would have had fallen apart. You start back over again and over again and over again, trying to cover your own nakedness. And that's what they were trying to do. And of course, their efforts were futile because they could not cover their nakedness. Listen, God asked the question, where art thou? Adam, where are you at? God knew where he was, but God wanted him to know where he was. God wanted Adam to think about what he had done and recognize I am in a place that's separate from God. I am ashamed. I am a sinner. I have done exactly what uh, God told me not to do. Now, a lot of people will say it's his fault. We talked about this earlier. It says by one man sin entered. Right. Amen. All right. Jesus was born of a woman because it's man's fault. All right. Let's keep moving. I'm going to... Make sure I have enough time here. Okay. Now, 
The fence surrounded the courtyard, and there was an entrance. When it came to Adam and Eve, Genesis 3.23 says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, and we know what happened. Uh, he put some cherubim to protect the entrance into the Garden of Eden. What does that mean? Well, it's like the fence. The fence was a teaching that you are no longer welcome here. You have no admittance. There is no way that you can come inside this place except through Jesus Christ. The only way was to go through Him. So uh, you can say that the sign says, Do not enter, you're not welcome because of sin. So that fence surrounded the courtyard, seven and a half feet tall. You couldn't jump over it. You couldn't raise the fence and crawl under it. When God gave the specifications, He made one way to enter the courtyard. Jesus says, I am the way. And Jesus is the only way to enter that fellowship. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. It'll take a second for that Bluetooth to kick in. Need for sacrifice. Keep going. All right, let's read that real quick. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year uh, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. All right, let's go to our next animation. And thou shalt make an altar of shipping wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, the height thereof shall be three cubits, and thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with breath. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make for it a great network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen wings and the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the wings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar, to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as they were shown thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Alright, and you can turn that off now. Okay, brazen altar gives the... Uh, Numbers in the Bible, seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet tall, uh, made of sheet and wood. Uh, and I'll give you a little uh, something to think about. I don't want people touching this, but you can touch this when you come up here. This is a little block of sheet and wood. Okay? It's called acacia wood in the modern terms. But if you look at this, you'll see that the uh, grain is just almost indistinguishable. And uh, when I got this, Brother Bobby Sparks, I bring him up a lot because he's the reason I have some of this information. But he gave me this piece of wood. And when I got it, it was a little crooked. I wanted it to stand up good and straight. So I thought, well, I'll just put it on my belt sander. And I've got a good belt sander. And I'll sand it down and get it where it's good and smooth. And that way you can see the grain. It took me about 10 minutes to get it to smooth off. But I'll give you an even better story. When Brother Bobby was in uh, Israel and he cut this and smuggled it into the States, it was a limb about yay big. Took him four hours to cut it with a handsaw, swapping back and forth. Get tired, the other guy would get the saw and then cut it. And finally, they were able to cut it into sections and he snuck it in his luggage on the way back. So uh, whether he was breaking the law, I don't know, but I'm glad I've got it. But look at that sometime. It's very hard, very dense. Surprisingly, though, it's not as heavy as you might think. But that was the base of the uh, brazen altar. It was overlaid, of course, in brass. There were a lot of qualities that would have given it. Uh, it would have uh, made it hermetically sealed. It would have kept out bugs and moisture and things of that nature. And when you talk about the brazen altar, the next key element is the grate, which is the picture showed what was underneath the brazen altar. It was something, I like to call it something like a, a barbecue grill because in essence that's what it was. It had to have meat that was cooking on top of it. 
But it was made to go up inside the brazen altar. That's what it sat on. And then it had the, uh, the pieces that came out and had the rings and carried by the staves, those long rods. And that's how they transported it. This piece of furniture had tools required. And I'm going to read a verse. Exodus 27, 3 says, And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. The location, we know, right past the entrance. That's the first thing a person saw when they stepped into there. Exodus 46 says, And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. The brazen altar's purpose was a place for the children of God to come in and offer acceptable offerings before the Lord. That was the place you made sacrifices. If you were an Israelite in that time period, that's where you went. And of course, later on, they set up the tabernacle, of course, once they entered into the holy place, the holy land. All right? The purpose of the offerings. We ought to know this. If you want a proper relationship with the Lord, you've got to have the right offering. Now, we often approach the altar at church. There are different reasons. I remember when I was saved. Y'all remember when you were saved? If you don't, you need to go to the altar. But I remember going, I was saved back at the back of the church. All right? I wasn't saved at the front, but I remember going to profess my salvation. To make that profession known that I had trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior. We also approach... Uh, the altar at the church or wherever it may be for repentance. Now, I'm correlating all this with the brazen altar. Also, we may have a burden. We pray. We have thanksgiving. There are things that we do. I don't know about y'all, but it's hard to get people to come down to the front. I mean, come on, people, let's pray. Let's get down here. And, of course, they pray where they are, and I know that. I see a lot of them uh, during the invitation. They'll bow their head and they'll pray. But, you know, sometimes... We need to get to the altar. We need to get our hearts right. That's what the brazen altar was all about. We need to regularly approach our spiritual altar before the Lord. All right, you can, you can turn that off. Just hit the top button up there. All right, no point in being on. Now we're going to talk about the offerings. If you have some good notes... These are good notes. We're going to talk about five specific offerings. And I'm just going to read a scripture uh, for the first one. And I, I have all the scriptures if you want them. But Leviticus, uh, the first several chapters, covers the five primary uh, offerings. First of all, there was the sin offering. That's found in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. And then, of course, it goes on to give instructions. First, man is born with a sin nature. We know that. You know, a lot of times you talk to a little child and they'll say, well, how do you know you're lost? Because I, sin I have committed sins. Folks, we're lost because we are sinners, not just commit sins. The sin offering was the first offering an individual would make. Sins of ignorance refers to being a sinner. The individual brought a bullock or a female goat or a lamb or whatever. Here's the thing about it. Uh, with these people, God gave an allowance for what they could afford at the time. Just something that he did. You may not be able to bring a larger animal, but you had to bring something for the sin offering. The animal had to belong to the individual. You couldn't go steal your neighbor's animal and take it before the altar and offer it. Obviously, that'd be a sin in the first place. But you either had to own it, you had to buy it, one way or the other. You raised it, you bought it, whatever the case may be. The animal had to belong to you, and it also had to be without blemish. That was part of, we're going to get to that. There was a priest who stood in the, uh, at the gate uh, whenever you approached, and he would examine that animal to make sure there were no blemishes. What does that mean? I don't know. Just any kind of imperfection, whatever it may have been. The Bible even talks about not having legs longer on one side than the other. Just any kind of blemish made that animal uh, to where it was not usable for a sacrifice. All right, uh, But one would uh, approach, have the animal examined, and then once that uh, priest approved that animal, 
he would remove his shoes, step inside the court, uh, courtyard, and go over to the brazen altar. Now this is what's interesting to me. Because when he got to the brazen altar, the priest was there with him, and he would instruct him what he needed to do. Okay, so he would take that animal... And we're still talking about the sin offering. He would pray over the head of that animal, confessing his sins. And he knew that this animal was a representation of the replacement or the one who would take the sin from him. It was a transference of sin. It was a picture. But it was a transference of sin. And you would pray and you would ask for forgiveness. Folks, when we get saved, we are asking God for forgiveness because we know we're sinners. We know we need salvation. And we ask Him for that. And guess what the Bible says? He gives it. We believe He gives it. Now, here's an interesting thought. You had to cut the throat of your own animal. What's the significance there? We have to sacrifice. But more importantly, Jesus gave Himself. These people had to sacrifice their own animal. It had to mean something. It had to be important to them. And of course, they cut the throat of the animal because they recognized that it was their fault that animal was dying. Now, there are some other examples of the sin offering. One was for the nation of Israel. It says the congregation. In other words, the congregation would get in a bad way, you know, in disarray, and they would bring a sin offering. The elders would get together, and of course they would acknowledge the condition of the nation, and they would bring this animal and offer it, and it was to do with the congregation of Israel. Also, a ruler, someone who was a leader uh, amongst the people. Occasionally, he might make his own offering that was considered a sin offering. You also had a sin offering for a priest. All right, preachers, we have to keep our hearts right too. Now, the sin offering is normally about salvation, but this was also about a spiritual representation of the relationship with God. And all of these had to do with an offering because of sin. Number two, the whole burnt offering. So we had the sin offering, now we have the whole burnt offering. This offering was about making a commitment to the Lord. All right, go back to Abraham and Isaac. You know, God told Abraham to take his son, Isaac. And he said, you travel this long distance with your son, with an animal, with some servants, with the wood, with the fire. You take them all the way where I'm going to lead you to, and then you're going to cut the throat of your own son upon an altar. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, I think after the first little while of walking and heading that direction, I think I would have stopped and turned around. You know what that means? It means my heart's not as dedicated as it should be. Fathers, think about your children. Would you give your child? That would be difficult. Abraham, I mean, without question. Don't, don't think that he questioned it. The Bible says he did it. He got up and he went and he took his son. It even says he built the altar. He laid him down on it, tied him up, had the knife raised, and the angel stopped him. And guess what? There was the ram caught in the thicket. Isaac's a good picture of us. The ram is a picture of Jesus. So the whole burnt offering... Same concept. You approach the uh, gate. It was examined. It was found worthy or not. But once it was found worthy, you took it inside. And this offering was a little bit different because this one was to be burnt completely. Every single bit of it. You took it in there. They would cut it up still. The other one they would cut up and they would divide it the way that it needed to be divided. But they would cut this up. And then they would burn it completely. None of it was taken away. It was all burnt completely. And I'll throw in something for you. Uh, if you come up here and look at my model sometime, you'll see I've got a little stack of firewood. And I'll just tell you, they didn't need a whole lot of firewood because the fat kept it all burning. That was part of the fuel in order to burn the animals. Now, let's kind of compare this to us. Everything a believer does should be to reflect the life and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen? What we do should reflect Him. He gave it all so that we should live for Him. Jesus gave everything in His service to the Lord. 
the offering was called the whole burnt offering because it was uh, burnt completely. Do you give the entire part of your life, every single part of your life to the Lord? Oh, me. There's not a single one of us in here that can say, I give everything I have to Him all the time. We make mistakes, but we're still supposed to make an offering to the Lord. I'm not talking about on an altar. We're supposed to offer ourselves to the Lord in dedication without any hesitation. We should say, Lord, I belong to You and I'm dedicating myself to You. Right. Every individual should willingly give his all to the Lord. What did He give for you? Right. Everything. Then you have the trespass offering. I'm running out of time. The trespass offering, the purpose of this offering was to represent a believer who had backslidden. Alright? Y'all know as well as I do, you know if you've backslidden from the Lord. And it happens. Preachers, it happens to us. There are times that our prayer life may grow cold. Our Bible study, we get lazy in our Bible study. We don't uh, communicate with the Lord the way we should. We begin to backslide and not live the way we should. Listen, we have to get on our knees uh, and pray to God in order to get that relationship back. Now listen, trespass offering was not about every single sin. It was after you had gotten away from God and you didn't feel His warmth and His love and His uh, fellowship because of you, not because of Him. God's always there. Amen? So here's the thing. You've got to get on your knees if you want to stand upright before the Lord. You've got to get on your knees. You've got to pray the trespass offering. I think sometimes we fail to repent and get our hearts right with God. We want to just make it the way we are. We can do it. We don't need any help. We've got it all figured out. Folks, we've got to repent of our sins. You know, a lot of times our churches aren't excited about the Lord because we're not. And I think about that. I thought about it yesterday. Sitting there in the pew and I'm thinking, you know... I'm not getting up to preach for a performance. Right? right? I'm not up there to perform. I'm up there to preach God's Word. But if I don't look like I'm convicted about it, what are they going to get out of it? Right. So we have to give all. We have to show that our lives are clean, but we're also excited. Amen. The next offering was the peace offering. This one was special in that the individual offered it as a result of overflowing joy in his life. And it was offered at the gate. If you studied it out, this one was offered at the gate. Uh, it didn't actually go inside. All right? So, one difference in this is that you brought this animal before the priest, and he looked at it, offered it, he took most of it back home. Go home, have a celebration. Us Baptists, we like to eat, amen? Well, they would bring that offering and they would take most of it back home and they would have some kind of a celebration uh, at their home. Folks, we ought to be joyful. Alright? We should be the most joyful people on the planet. We sit around frowning all the time. Finally, you had the meat offering. And interestingly enough, this is an offering that had no meat, no animal was offered. That word meat is from the British word food. So it was a grain that had been ground up and was made into uh, cakes. Uh, had a combination of flour and oil and frankincense baked into cakes. And you took it up there and what would happen is you'd pinch a little off and it'd be thrown onto the altar and the rest would be taken and eaten by the priest. There's an example of the church supposed to take care of you. Give you what you need. All right. This offering was a spiritual picture of giving something back to the Lord in recognition of all your blessings. We could all stop here right now and have a testimonial service about what God's done for us. I could tell you, and I've already gave you a little bit of information about my salvation. I was a young boy and I trusted Christ as my Savior and I knew that He saved my soul and I knew that He worked in my life ever since. But then we can talk about other things. God has blessed me with a family. My wife, we've been married this October, will be 26 years. Praise the Lord. I have a, a little girl, 13 years old, adopted. Had her since she was born. She's got all kinds of uh, physical ailments and uh, situations, but you know what? She's a blessing. Amen. 
have my church family. I can be excited. Even though they're a bunch of stubborn individuals, I still love them. Amen. I'm blessed to have so many things. So do we give gratitude with no expectations? Think about that one. God, I just want to thank you because you're so great. I don't have any expectations about what you're going to give me in return for that gratification. I just want to give you praise and glory and, and honor just because you're great. We ought to have that attitude when it comes to that meat offering, expressing our overall thankfulness for everything that we have in our lives. Now, since the sin in the garden, man has needed a sacrifice. Abel proved, however, that the sacrifice had to be done by God's standards. Let me tell you something about uh, uh, Cain. My thought is, and I just said my thoughts, so y'all write that down if you want. It doesn't make a big difference. I believe that Cain brought a good offering as far as man's point of view. Good fruit. You know, healthy. It was a good, solid offering in his mind. I don't think he brought the rotten vegetables. I think he brought something that was good in his own mind. But what was significant? Well, it didn't bleed. It didn't bleed. It had to be blood. It had to be God's way. How did they know what they were supposed to bring? Because Adam and Eve would have taught them. This is what God expects. He made those coats of skin for us by shedding innocent blood so that we might have a covering. So, God gave the instructions for the brazen altar. It provided the individual the proper place and the proper method of offering his sacrifice. Now, if you can't have a relationship based on uh, God's terms, I don't know what you're going to do because you can't say this is... The you ever heard people say, well, we worship the way we want to. Yeah. We have our own way of doing things. Preacher, we don't need to go to a church. We can still worship God just the same. Jesus Christ established a church. Shouldn't we go and worship the way He would have us to? Amen. I saw Brother Mike had uh, been posting on Facebook about the church. <laughs> Whew, that was some interesting reading right there. But folks, God gave us the way to properly worship. That's right. And you can't have a relationship based on your terms. It has to be by God. So quickly, sin offering, propitiation, atonement for sin. You know the word uh, propitiation in the New Testament means mercy seat. Look it up sometime. It's a good word. The whole burnt offering, dedication. What does that mean? I have to reject sin. You can't have your pet sins and serve God too. You've got to have that separation. Trespass offering, expiation, which means forgiveness and repentance. Well, if I've got sin, I've got to get rid of it. So it just goes along with the other one. The uh, peace offering, celebration. Joy because of fellowship and blessings. Finally, the meat offering, satisfaction. Are you satisfied in the Lord today? Amen. Do you have a reason to be satisfied? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. My Lord satisfies my needs. He takes care of my spiritual needs. He takes care of my physical needs. We should be, I said this already, we should be the most thankful and joyful and happy people on the planet. Now, we may not have a brazen altar to approach in order to make offerings. But we do need to approach the throne of God in whatever shape, form, or fashion that we need to get our hearts straightened out, whether it be for salvation, whether it be for dedication, whether it be for uh, expiation. We need to approach God's throne on a regular basis. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment and the perfect representation of all the offerings that were made. Right. So there is a need for sacrifice. And I'm thankful, and y'all can appreciate this too. I'm so thankful we don't have to have somebody to bring their animals to us and we have to examine it, old stinky sheep or whatever. We don't have to examine that. We let God take care of examining the individual that needs to get his heart right. That's one thing about it. I don't want people coming and confessing their sins to me because it's not going to do any good. There's a big misconception of the idea of priest today. I don't want to know your dirty secrets. Now, if you need somebody to talk to, I'm here for you. But talk to God. Go to the altar that He's provided. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll...
take a break. Dear Heavenly Father, I